Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. It's the last session before lunch, so we'll make sure we'll finish on time. What we're going to talk about is five mistakes that folks make uh, when writing a streaming app. Really, these are mistakes we have made, but we wanted to look smarter, and so we said mistakes people make. Uh, the very common question that we get for this uh, presentation is where are the slides? And the answer to that question is at the very bottom, tiny.cloudera.com slash streaming dash app. Uh, so if you want to take a note of that link and follow along as we go, that would be great. All right, let's move on. Ted and I are also co-authors of this book called Hadoop Application Architectures, uh, along with two other wonderful people who are not in this talk uh, at the moment. Uh, we have a book signing for the same book, which talks about larger big data architectures, including Spark, of course, uh, at 1 p.m. right after this talk at Cl the Cloudera booth. So if you would like to get a copy that's signed by us, uh, feel free to make your way there. There are long lines, so you probably want to show up early. All right, agenda is uh, five mistakes when writing streaming application. The first one, actually the fifth one, as this slide says, is not monitoring and managing your jobs. So the batch systems had this very interesting, simplistic idea that you read your data from a file system, and you do something with it, and then you write it back to the same file system. So you could use something like Uzi or Escaban or Luigi or Cron for orchestration, and you could have validation logic in your job to say like, oh, if the input directory is empty, don't do anything, right? And you could send an email at the end of the job, you could persist the state back to the file system, all is great. But in streaming job, is a continuously running job, right? So orchestration in Spark Streaming, for example, is automatic because it's a microbatch system, which means every microbatch interval, you're gonna get um, a, a set of data and you're gonna do something with it. But there are systems that Spark Streaming uses, for example, uh, that aren't designed or weren't originally designed for streaming. So an example is Yarn. In Yarn, it doesn't, Yarn is a distributed resource manager and it has logs on all the node managers, but it doesn't aggregate these logs together for you to view them in a single coherent place until the job finishes. And guess what? A streaming job never finishes. Next thing, Spark, legacy Spark streaming has this concept of checkpoints, and who's used checkpoints in Spark? All right. And who thinks they are kind of broken? Okay, all of you who used it, right? So checkpoints can't survive an app or a Spark upgrade, right? And so you need to clear your checkpoint directory during the upgrade. And a few big questions remain unanswered. The first one is, how do you go about managing your job? Which is, where do I run my driver? How do I restart the driver automatically if it fails? How do I pause the job? And the next one is, how do I monitor my Spark streaming job, right? So how do I prevent a backlog of stuff that's going on? How do I keep tabs on the health of the driver and all the other processes, right? So most of the discussion that's gonna follow, that's gonna assume that Yarn's the underlying resource manager for Spark, um, but this applies to Mesos or standalone if you're using that. So here's a quick recap. If you're using Yarn, you've got a Spark driver, which is in the top left corner. This is a Yarn client mode, so a driver runs in your client application. If you're using the cluster mode, your driver runs on a Yarn container on that cluster, right? So one more time, if you're using the client mode, the client dies, the driver dies, and so your job dies. But if you're using the cluster mode, if your client dies, which is the place where you launched your job from, that's okay, because your driver is running not on the client, but on the cluster, right? So the first question gets answered. Where do you run your driver? Duh, run it in the, on the cluster mode, right? The next one is how do you restart drivers? So there are these two settings in Yarn which you can set up. The first one, Yarn max attempts. So it says how many attempts Yarn can make on the driver for restart before it gives up and says, well, something must be wrong, I'm gonna kill the job. And then there's an interval because you gotta, if it's a long running job, you can't monotonically count the number of failures, you have to reset the number of failures every so often. So in this case, we, you, if you set like the first property to two and the next property to an hour, you're saying I will accept two failures per hour. Any more than that, fail the job. If you're using Mesos and you want to pause the job, you can use this thing called Marathon, which has a suspend button. And if you're using Yarn, there's a separate way to gracefully shut down your app, and you can do that. Okay, so for monitoring, there's a bunch of stuff you can do. There's a UI that shows you processing time, scheduling delay, and total delay, but of course, maybe you want more. And if you want more, Spark has a configurable drop wizard library which you can hook onto something like Graphite and Grafana to see these dashboard metrics, much of which are not exposed on the UI. So to summarize, 
some of this stuff is afterthought, right? This is the stuff we talked about yarn as far as streaming, but it's possible in structured streaming you can use the streaming query listener, which was introduced in Apache Spark 2.1. If you want to read more about this mistake, these are the two references. Again, all the links are in the slides, so all you have to do is go to that, the first link, tiny.cloudera.com slash streaming dash app, uh, and you will have access to the links. All right, let's move on to the next mistake, not considering data loss. So you say, all right, now I figured out how do I make my driver restart automatically, but can I lose data amongst these restarts? And of course, we won't be talking about this mistake at this conference if you could lose data. So the answer is no, you can't lose data, but you have to do things the right way. Now the question is, how do you do things the right way? And the answer depends on how you are reading the data. So there are three different ways you, you can have your files, uh, your data sources in Spark Streaming. You could be reading from a file, say from S3 or HDFS, uh, or you could be using a receiver, um, so reading data from Flume or maybe even Kafka, but also there's a separate Kafka direct stream which you could be using for reading data uh, in Spark Streaming. And so the answer, the right way, is different for each of these categories. So the first category is file sources. You've got some data on HDFS or S3, you were reading that in a stream processing system, um, and the font is off. So if you're using files, you can use checkpointing. And checkpointing is very simple, it's just like instead of creating that context on its own, after creating the context, you would say S context dot checkpoint and give the checkpoint directory. And when I say checkpointing, I refer to two things. It checkpoints the metadata, which is your configuration, which batches are incomplete, and this allows you to recover from driver failures, but it also checkpoints the data. So if you're doing a stateful operation, you're gonna have lineage of RDDs that goes back to the entirety of time when you started the job. And so data checkpointing allows you to trim that lineage when you're doing stateful operations, say using upstate state by key. And Spark checkpoints, checkpoint both the data and the metadata, so you're fine. The gotchas, again, are that it won't work across an app upgrade, won't work across a Spark upgrade, so you have to clear out the checkpointing directory across upgrades if you're using legacy streaming. If you're using structured streaming, this is all taken care of because checkpoints are JSON-based and not based on the Java serialization like was the case previously. Now, this use case is reading files from file system processing them via streaming, and then writing them back to the file system. However, there is another way to do the same goal, and Ted loves to rant, so I just made it very obvious that that's gonna be a one slide rant. Yes, <clears throat> so I wanna say something like 40% of this presentation is me ranting, so this is the first part of it. Um, I don't like using streaming on top of files, right? I would rather have a long-lived Spark application that could do things that I wanted it to do, like maybe it'll process the files, put them to an intermediate folder, and then put them to a process folder or a failure folder. I want more control than Spark Streaming that can give me. Fair, all right, so the second source is receiver-based sources. So the idea is that you have a separate receiver process that's gonna read the data from an input stream, and then Spark Streaming is gonna process it, and the result's gonna go out to, say, a, a, a storage system. So for receiver-based sources, if you want to prevent data loss, you have to do two things. You have to enable checkpointing, but you also have to enable a write-head log. And you can do that using these properties. By default, the write-head log is disabled, because we want job security. So, why do we need a write-head log? Data on the receiver is stored in executor memory. So without a write-head log, a failure in the middle of operation can lead to data loss. With a write-head log, the data that comes from the receiver is first written to this durable storage, so like HDFS or S3, before it's acknowledged back to the source saying, I've gotten it, right? So, but the write ahead log also has some gotchas, right? It makes a copy of the data. Now, if you're storing your data in HDFS, that means you may be making three copies of that data on HDFS for every single record, right? So first thing you can do is in your actual Spark job, you can set the storage level to memory and disk serialization because guess what? Your data is already being copied three times on HDFS. And for S3, you also have to enable this particular property for the driver and the executor. All right, now you say, but what about Kafka? If I'm reading data from Kafka, I've got three copies of data on Kafka, and now you also asked me to make three copies of the same data on the right head log. What's going on here? Now, for Kafka, there's a separate direct connector. In fact, I recommend folks use the direct connector if you use Kafka, don't use receivers, for many other reasons. Higher throughput is probably the biggest one of them, right? All right, so there is no need for using right head log for the direct connector. So this is the receiver-based architecture. You see the driver, 
sends some information which is asking the executors to launch jobs and the executor, a particular set of executors is running receiver which then use the Kafka high level API to read the data from Kafka and store the data on the wall which is down at the very bottom. If you're using the direct connector then the driver is just sending the, the executors these offset ranges which read the data directly from Kafka. So each executor is hitting Kafka and reading data from particular topic partitions. So why don't you need a wall when you're using direct connector? Because data is stored in Kafka. If there were a failure, just an offset gets replayed to the new executor who picks it up from the offset that uh, the failed executor was reading from. But the direct connector has its own gotchas. So you need to track offsets for driver recovery. And where should you track offsets? The very first thing people think is well, checkpoint, but checkpoints are not recoverable for reasons we have talked, so you have to recover your own offsets in order to manage them, and Zookeeper, HDFS, or a database seems like a very good place to manage. Summary, you can prevent data loss, instruct your streaming, state is stored in memory, uh, backed by a wall starting Spark 2.1, but for others, you can use uh, uh, the, the methods that we described previously, depending on your data sources. Here are some references. I'm gonna pass it on to Ted to talk about mistake three. All right, so if you've been to any data conference in the last two years, probably about 30 to 50% of the presentations have been about streaming and uh, IoT and how streaming is the answer to everything. And they've been asking a lot, like, when do you use streaming? And you'll hear a lot of times that the answer is always. Everything should be through streaming. And I'm asking us to reconsider that. Um, not everything should go through streaming. And there's different types of streaming, right? So these are the use cases we're gonna go through, and we're gonna go through them real quickly. First one is atomic enrichment. This is when you change things, right? Uh, then there's notifications. This is when you react to things. Then there is joining. This is, uh, let's say you have two large data sets and you need to collide them to either write something out or make a uh, notification. Uh, you might wanna just do partitioning for a lot of reasons. Um, you might just want to write it to disk or write it to some type of database. You might want to do counting, machine learning, or uh, progressive an a analytics and stuff like that. So, and you might want to do a combination of these. So let's briefly go into, do you need streaming and what type of streaming do you need um, when you're doing each use case? So the first one is atomic enrichments. So yes, it's a totally viable thing to do this in streaming. Do you need Spark streaming to do this? Kind of don't. Um, a microservice architecture is probably all you need. Um, you don't need the entire robustness of Spark Streaming to do just enrichment by itself. You could, but you don't really need it. The next one is notifications. Would you use something like Spark Streaming for notifications? So in case in the keynote, I missed the keynote, in case they've solved the latency problem, did they solve the latency problem in the keynote? Sort of, so until they solve the latency problem, until they get it down to like low, low milliseconds, you're not gonna be using Spark Streaming to do credit card authentication or um, you know, fraud analytics on video games or something like that. What you'll probably still be using is a microservice architecture, right? Something extremely lightweight that sits on the back end of Kafka and re can return in less than a millisecond, right? Um, just some ideas of how this can be done. Microservices can cache data into different partitions. You can use Kafka to uh, repartition that data, so you never actually have to go to a data store to make that decision. You're just making the decision straight off memory. There's an alternative approach where you could grab the data from an external store. These both can be used in, in parallel, you know, to protect you against microservice failure. But in short, if you're returning less than two milliseconds, something's wrong because you should be returning much faster than that, right? Okay, so the next problem is joining. Do you need Spark Streaming for joining? Well, it makes it really, really easy, right? Um, if you have to do joining in a microservice, is it possible? It is very possible, right? You can use partitioning with Kafka and then each micro, uh, microservice would be given so many partitions and you can partition by the key and it's taken care of for you and it would be, it would be probably this, you know, similar or better throughput with lower latency, but is it better? And that would really determine what your long-term goal is of the join. If your long-term goal is to do notifications, you're probably not gonna use Spark Streaming. But if your uh, goal is maybe something like counting, 
or batched writes to a system, then maybe. But joining itself does not mean you need a complex uh, stream processing framework. So, um, okay, Oops. so partitioning. Oops. We've kind of already talked about this. So partitioning, um, if you're familiar with Kafka, Kafka partitions for you. So um, this is also something you don't need a large uh, framework for. Um, now ingestion, do you need a large framework like uh, a Spark Streaming to ingest data? And again, you kind of don't. And in some cases, it's not anywhere near the right solution, right? You probably would not use Spark Streaming to write to HDFS. I guess you could, but it wouldn't be ideal, right? You probably also would not use it to write to, um, to write to S3. Sorry. Now, you could use Spark off of Kafka to write to S3 and HDFS because you have more controls. Because when you're writing to them, you want to make sure you have the ideal file sizes and the right number of files um, that are going into those systems. And if you're using non-Spark streaming, there are ways to do that. I guess you could kind of do it with Spark streaming. It would kind of be weird. You have to do a count. Then you have to, yeah, yeah be Most people weird. do a follow-on job. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But again, may not be ideal. And again, a microservice architecture or something as simple as like Kafka Connect or Flume might be more ideal for this. And now counting. This is where it shines, right? So a complicated Spark streaming application is really good for counting. I got one minute, so I got to go quick. Um, do we have that diagram that does all the fancy stuff that shows why it's good? Let's see. Is that coming later? No, it's not coming. OK, it's not coming later, so you don't get that. Yes, it is coming later. So I'm not going to tell you yet why, but it's better. Um, we'll get to it in a minute. Um, and then machine learning, Spark has a great framework for machine learning. Now, some can argue, and I think it's a very valid argument, that the ML libraries and ML lib could use a little bit of polish and a little bit of additional features. Um, but it has a good framework for that. And that stuff can run during your streaming process, which is really valuable. And I've got a couple more seconds. And progressive analytics. So I have seen this in practice. Um, We've actually done some of this inside of our parent company, uh, doing SQL on streams in real time. And some of you might have done that too. And I think there are some benefits to that. But I think the benefits of SQL, like injectable SQL on streams, is in its infancy. And to believe that you could have a 100 or a 1,000 person company that has, I mean, a 1,000 person SQL company where you have hundreds of concurrent SQL users running SQL on a stream, I think at this point would be almost imaginary to believe that that would actually work. Um, so it's, it's, it's a cute technology. It's cool, but it's, I still think it's in its infancy. Did I finish everything? OK, so when do we need uh, uh, streaming? Counting is probably your best thing. We didn't go into uh, windowing, but windowing, um, progressive analytics, and if you're really going to do machine learning, like progressive machine learning, like seeing how your centers move in k-means progressively, it's really kind of cool. OK, now let's talk about counting, because counting, we talked about, is one of our primary reasons for using a, a streaming architecture. So the big thing is no duplicates. So if you, you've been in this industry for a long time, you're aware of Lambda. So you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm sure almost everyone in this room knows what Lambda is, and everyone has a slightly different definition. Um, some people will say Lambda is any time that you have stream and batch, if you believe that, that's fine. That's not the right definition, but that's fine. <laughs> um, the right definition is you're using batch to correct accounting mistakes in the streaming process, right? Because streaming cannot be perfect, or as it was previously thought. So in the old world, you had Storm, and you had a whole bunch of failures, and you had no Kafka, and all you had was Storm and Cassandra. And what you would do is you would increment Cassandra, uh, Cassandra, which, by the way, is a slow operation. You should not be incrementing. And then it would commit to Cassandra and then fail the acknowledgment in Storm. And then Storm would reprocess the event and then increment again, thus coming up with the wrong answer. Right? This also applies to things like duplicates and stuff like that. So we would need batch to later go back and fix this process, right? And then you could use the batch and the streaming to get a good approximation of the value. Then comes along Spark Streaming and says, hey, what happens if I make batch and streaming one thing? <clears throat> well, that's kind of what they did. So they have this context 
of an RDD that's stateful through multiple, uh, through multiple iterations of uh, Spark streaming. And what happens here is um, the state of that RDD is in, is, um, is committed in concert with the iteration. So they fail together or they succeed together. So by doing this, you get a much more complicated chart. I'm not gonna walk through this because I only have five minutes, but the big thing to note is instead of an increment, we have a put. And if we fail, we fail in such a way where the value is correct at the end. Does that make sense? Now there are still problems that you can screw up here because there's a big pipe and there's lots of shit that can happen in your pipe, okay? So just because we fixed the Spark streaming layer doesn't mean we fixed everything else. The big problem that we need to do, to worry about is double submits. Now Kafka is coming out with a solution for double submits that doesn't solve all the problems with double submits because you can still have double submits that are legitimately calling the submit to Kafka more than once. Um, to really do it correctly that I found is I like to put like a sequence ID on a source and then you can keep the last sequence for each source in memory. If you have over a billion sources, that could be a problem, but if your source is around 100,000 or something like that, it's totally manageable. Um, if you're interested in more detail on this, there's too much to go over in here. There's lots of places where things can go wrong. But you can actually make everything go correctly, too. Okay, am I on time? Okay, I'm switching over. So sequence numbers, puts over increments, and um, yeah, what's the consider large? Code? It's like the processing time versus event time. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, so the other big thing is, yeah, processing ver time versus event time. I think that's solved now, right? Did Spark solve that? Yeah. Yeah, that's Spark solved. Machinery. Now, if anybody tells you that's solved, either Spark or Flink, they're not telling you the entire truth. There's a whole bunch of, like, edge conditions. And if that is your world, you need to dig into that because at some point, the buffer of those edge conditions will expire. Still you. Oh, still me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not shutting down your app well. Are you not doing this one? All right. Half an app. Can, <laughs> sorry about that There's one. There's a bus, go under. There we go. Um, can we shut down gracefully? Um, are you sure you're not doing this one? <laughs> All right, you do this one. <laughs> All right, so remember in the first mistake we talked about graceful yarn shutdown, right? And the way you shut down a, gra a yarn app gracefully is you actually kill it but gracefully, and then you resume it from that part, right? So what we are talking about here is that yarn pausing, but we're also talking in general about how do you gracefully shut down a streaming app, say if you're doing an upgrade or a maintenance or something like that, okay? Before we talk about this, we have to define what we really mean by graceful, and there are three things we talk about here. The first one is that the offsets should be known. How much data you have processed so far, and that you should stop it at the right place, right? You're probably not in the middle of a batch, but you've known these offsets, you persist them, and you stop, right? And the last one is that your state should be stored externally, right? So um, that allows you to pick up from where you left. This is more than the offsets. You could have some external state. All right, so how can you do this graceful shutdown? The first way is that there's a bunch of thread hooks in Spark that allow you to do um, a graceful shutdown. So here's the copy paste from that API. Uh, not really gonna go over it, but the next one is here, what happens is you have, uh, it's just some sample code here, it's just like evading termination and then you call the shutdown. So the third line of the code is an executor shutdown. Uh, the other way you can do this, this is the second way, is you can use the command line. So here, notice the Spark submit command line has a dash dash kill uh, parameter to the driver and then you also need this particular configuration property called stop gracefully and shutdown to be set to true and here's the code copy pasted from Spark onto how that works. And the last one, and this is our favorite, is to use a marker file. Now, this isn't written in any book or anything, it's just like best practices we have learned over the years, is you put a file on, say, HDFS, uh, which your app actually touches when it starts, okay? And so as your app is running, this file already always exists, it's empty, but when you wanna stop this job, you remove this file. Okay, so you say, what happens next? You actually have a separate thread running in your Spark driver Checks which for this file. And when this file is no longer present, it knows that you have wanted it to shut down and it calls that particular graceful stop. So you see streaming context.stop 
and it says stop the Spark context as well, but also shut down gracefully. So this is our favorite method of shutting down. And for storing offsets, it's very similar to how we defined earlier. You want to store your offsets externally in Zookeeper, HDFS, or HBase, uh, so you can recover on restart. So to summarize, this particular mistake, you use the provided command line or you use the ma marker file to sh shut down your uh, Spark app gracefully. And we will conclude now. So the five mistakes that we learned that um, cause problems when it comes to Spark streaming jobs. First one, not knowing how to manage and monitor a job. The second one, how to prevent data loss. And then Ted talked about, do I need to use Spark streaming? Are there other tools that are not as big and bulky as Spark streaming that perhaps can solve the same job? Uh, next one is how do you achieve exactly once or effectively once semantics and not count duplicates? Uh, and the last one is how do you gracefully shut down your app? One more time, there's a book signing right after this talk uh, at the Cloudera booth. And thank you very much. We'd love to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you.